There are two huge mistakes that are often made with magnesium, and I see it all of the time at the clinic. So instead of making those mistakes, I'm going to arm you with the knowledge that you need to avoid them. Plus, I'll go through common questions about dose and forms of magnesium. Magnesium is an essential mineral that's required for more than 300 enzyme reactions in the body. It's involved in protein synthesis, muscle and nerve function, blood glucose control and blood pressure regulation. It also contributes to bone development, DNA synthesis, and the production of the antioxidant glutathione. Magnesium plays a critical role in the active transport of calcium and potassium ions across cell membranes, and all of this is vital for nerve pulse conduction, muscle contractions, and maintaining a normal heart rhythm. Yet despite magnesium's importance, the evidence suggests that many of us simply aren't getting enough. So according to a recent estimate, 60% of adults do not get enough to hit the average daily intake level, and 45% of the US population is magnesium deficient. And it isn't super easy to find out if our magnesium levels are low in the first place, which we'll return to in a minute. But why do we need to worry about this? Especially when having low levels of magnesium to cause obvious symptoms, that's relatively rare. Well, the reason is that we've got lots of data linking low magnesium levels to serious health problems, and one of them is heart disease. And as I go through this data, see if you can spot the big issue with these studies and the first mistake that I'm referring to. There was an observational study of over 14,000 people over a 12-year period. It showed that higher magnesium intakes were associated with an almost 40% reduction in the risk of sudden death from heart problems. Then in 2013, a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition involved over 300,000 people. It showed that higher magnesium intakes were associated with a 30% lower risk of heart disease. So you can see this relationship clearly on the graph from a separate study published in the Journal of the American Heart Association in 2016. It shows that low magnesium levels are associated with a 36% higher risk of death compared to high levels of magnesium. And it's not just heart disease that's linked with magnesium. Higher magnesium intakes are associated with a lower risk of strokes according to a 2012 study involving over 240,000 people. There are also strong associations between magnesium and measures related to metabolic syndrome. So these include blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar, and insulin sensitivity. So for example, a 2011 study involved over 500,000 people showed that higher magnesium intakes are associated with a 22% reduction in the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The list goes on. Low magnesium intake is associated with dementia, poor hearing, Parkinson's disease, depression, anxiety, and more. But there is something really important to notice about these studies, and this is something that many health influencers and people new to this field miss. Much of the data that we've got when it comes to magnesium is from observational studies. So these studies that give us associations, but associations by themselves don't necessarily point to causation. So let me explain this. Take the example of higher intakes of magnesium being associated with lower risks of developing type 2 diabetes. It might be that magnesium directly lowers these risks, but it could be that higher magnesium intakes are due to much better diets, and it's the better diet that's lowering the risk of developing diabetes. Or it could be that people who get more magnesium from their diets, they also exercise more, and the exercise is the critical factor. The point here is that we don't know for sure without controlled trials we were able to isolate the impact of magnesium alone. Alone. So we can't say yet that getting more magnesium alone will lower your risk of type 2 diabetes, for example. And I highlight this as a first mistake because people are often led astray about the magnitude of impact when it comes to magnesium. It's easy to cherry pick an impressive sounding stat from observational data as justification to start taking magnesium supplements without fixing the real reason why you might be low in magnesium in the first place. So more on that later. Now, when we switch our focus to randomized controlled trials so that we can actually figure out what the impact of magnesium supplements is for our health, we've got some intriguing data about sleep and that's about it. One study investigated magnesium supplements in 46 elderly patients. This demographic was chosen because insomnia is common among older adults, and half of them took magnesium daily for eight weeks, and the other half took a placebo. They assessed the impact on sleep using a questionnaire and a sleep log, and they also took blood levels. They found that magnesium increased sleep time and the percentage of time in bed that they were asleep. It also decreased insomnia scores and how long it took to fall asleep. Blood samples showed magnesium supplements increased levels of melatonin, which is an important sleep hormone. They also decreased cortisol. So when cortisol levels are too high, this interferes with the body's natural progression from daytime mode to sleep. And then there's a 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis. It found that magnesium supplements reduced the time it takes to fall asleep by about 17 minutes in older adults who have got poor sleep at baseline. 
and a meta-analysis from last year examined randomized controlled trials of magnesium supplements to improve sleep. Five out of the eight included trials that reported improvements in at least one aspect of sleep. So while in many cases when it comes to magnesium, we need more clinical data to establish causal connections, I think we can confidently say this, magnesium is an essential element for our health. Many of us aren't getting enough, and higher intakes are strongly correlated with many health benefits. But as we saw, a common mistake is made here. Influencers will often cherry pick a stat from that observational data as justification to take magnesium supplements and over promise the benefit. And patients bring this up with me all of the time at the clinic and they bring a stat as justification for taking large doses of magnesium. So instead we first need to address the underlying cause as to why our intakes might be suboptimal so that we can get the most health benefit. More on that shortly, but first here's the second mistake. Now given these correlations, it's critical to ensure that we're getting enough magnesium, but how do we do that? Well a blood test is the most common way to check magnesium levels in a clinical setting, but here's the problem with magnesium blood tests. An adult body contains approximately 25 grams of magnesium with 50 to 60 percent present in the bones and most of the rest is in soft tissues. Less than one percent of the total magnesium is in our blood and the magnesium that's in our blood is under tight control. So assessing magnesium status is difficult because most magnesium is inside our cells or in our bones. And blood tests, they've got little correlation with the total amount of magnesium in our bodies. So for that reason, a person can have normal levels of blood magnesium, but they could be lacking in total body magnesium. Now, there are other methods for assessing magnesium status, including measuring concentrations in saliva and urine, but there's no single method that's considered satisfactory. So this is the second mistake is that people can be led into a false sense of security that their magnesium intake is fine based on a blood test result. And I see this again all of the time at the clinic where patients have paid for a magnesium blood test and they don't interpret the results correctly. So in the absence of a convenient way to test for magnesium levels, what is the right strategy? Well, I advise my patients to simply make sure that they're getting an adequate intake. If we're getting an adequate intake, then most people don't need to pay for a magnesium blood test. This is of course outside of people with absorption issues, like with issues with their bowel, such as inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease. So an engineering phrase might help make sense of what I'm trying to say here. The best part is no part. The best process is no process. If we're getting enough magnesium and we're reaching our recommended daily intakes, then our levels will be fine and there's no use in using a poor measurement anyway. So how do we make sure that we're reaching our recommended daily intakes of magnesium? And no, we don't just throw supplements at the situation. Remember mistake number one. Now, the recommended daily intake for magnesium is 420 milligrams for men and 320 milligrams for women. And many of us are deficient because we're eating processed, refined foods. Magnesium is stripped away and instead of improving our diet, many of us just turn to the easy option and buy a magnesium pill. But the problem with that approach is that you miss out on all of the other health benefits from eating whole foods foods. So the first step is to add in more whole foods, rich in magnesium to your diet. So magnesium is found in leafy green vegetables like spinach, legumes, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. Generally, foods containing dietary fiber provide magnesium. Meat contains some magnesium, but not as much as plant-based sources. And this hard work is critical to actually benefit your health. There's no point, again, in just throwing supplements at the situation. Where magnesium supplements are useful is helping to supplement an already healthy diet. Because even with a good diet, it can be challenging to reach the recommended daily intakes of magnesium, and this leads to the dose discussion. This is especially true today, as researchers are uncovering declining nutrient levels in many crops. So even though a patient might have a great diet, the magnesium intake might still not be ideal, and this is where a low-dose supplement might be useful. And as the name suggests, it should supplement a healthy diet, not replace it. This is why I included 126 milligrams of magnesium in my sleep supplement, as well as in microvitamin. But just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. Now 126 milligrams is about the equivalent of 30% of the recommended daily intake. It's a supplement. As we saw, it's been linked to sleep improvements in several studies. It also helps me hit my daily target of magnesium, so I know that I'm always reaching that magnesium level. But this leads to a question that many of my patients ask. You'll see magnesium supplements come in many different forms. So which form is best? And there's a sneaky trick here that you need to watch out for when looking at magnesium labels, which we'll cover shortly. 
We'll start by looking at magnesium oxide because it's an incredibly common form. It's so cheap and it's also got a high elemental percentage of magnesium at 60%. So you only need 700 milligrams of magnesium oxide to reach the 420 milligram level of elemental magnesium. This can easily fit into one pill. But supplement companies will often just put 400 milligrams of magnesium oxide on the label and people think that they're getting 400 milligrams of elemental magnesium, but they aren't. They're only getting 240 milligrams of elemental magnesium, so you need to be very careful when reading the label. Magnesium oxide though, it's poorly absorbed and it's not the form that I use. Then there's magnesium citrate. It's also cheap, it's very well absorbed, but it's only 11% elemental magnesium, so you need to have much more of it to reach the targets of elemental magnesium. And let's say you want to hit 126 milligrams of elemental magnesium from a supplement, which is again about 30% of the recommended daily intake. You have to consume 1,145 milligrams of magnesium citrate to hit that target of 126 milligrams of elemental magnesium. Magnesium citrate also has a laxative effect, which can be useful for some people. And before we get onto my favorite forms of magnesium, we also need to mention magnesium L3 and 8. This is a form that's become incredibly popular recently. Animal studies have suggested that magnesium L3 and 8 may improve the memory of mice. And this is because, again, in mice, magnesium L3 and 8 seems to get through the blood brain barrier and reach the brain. But in humans, the results are conflicting. There's one small study funded by the makers of magnesium L3 and 8. It showed a small increase in performance on executive functions, but there was no improvement, however, in several other areas when compared to a placebo. Another small study investigated whether taking magnesium L3 and 8 for two months improved learning and memory in 17 people with dementia. It was conducted at Stanford University, and it was completed in mid-2016. Based on the results posted to clinicaltrials.gov in February 2021, patients in the study showed no clinically meaningful improvement in cognitive function. So I'm not convinced that this expensive form of magnesium will offer any additional benefits. Instead, my favored forms of magnesium are those that are bound to an amino acid, such as magnesium glycinate and magnesium taurate. They're very well absorbed, and both glycine and taurine have really interesting roles to play in our health. So the sleep supplement that I take uses magnesium glycinate, since glycine also has been shown to improve sleep. And I use magnesium taurate and microvitamin, which I take in the morning. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. Just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. Magnesium is just one of the minerals that we're often deficient in, and there's another that's surprisingly important, and it's got links to heart health. And this one has been established by a lot of clinical data, so make sure to check out this next video here to find out which mineral deficiency is a key player for one of the most important risk factors for heart attacks.